I just wanted to ask, uh, first and foremost, how has your perception of the adult film industry changed from when Deep Throat was released? I'm going to, I want to jump in and get yeah. that. Um, just yeah. in that, you know, I think it, it bears noting that when our father started making movies in the 1960s, there was no adult film industry. There was no such thing. He was um, an underground filmmaker is what they called it. This was before independent films and the movement of independent films. Anybody who was not working with the Hollywood system was considered to be an underground filmmaker. And so those early films were not considered you know, adult industry films at all. But um, with the success of Deep Throat, Behind the Green Door, and then a number of other you know, uh, big films during the golden age of porn, it helped to create an time out in the 80s, there were hundreds of, of uh, you know, companies making adult films. So, um, you know, the industry exploded. And now in the, you know, today it's changed even further in that um, it's moved from studios, you know, making content um, for people to people making their own content. You know, all, you, all it takes is uh, someone willing and a computer and an internet connection and you have lots of cam girls and, um, and uh, only fans and that kind of thing. So that's transformed the industry completely. Right, right. I completely agree with that. And Krista, our same question for you. How, do you. how do you think of this like transition now, especially as a woman seeing this transition? Well, what, what I see is I think like sex is sort of diluted these days because everyone is flashing themselves and twerking and tweaking on the internet. And, and it, it's like, it's so passe right now. It's not, you know, it's, it, it, it's almost like the human body is so beautiful, but it, I think it's been dumbed down a lot that, mm -hmm. you know, women are scantily clad and even young women are just showing themselves off. And, you know, it, like I said, it's very diluted and it's, it's hard to watch the younger generation growing up into a society where sex isn't something that's beautiful and erotic and, and should be like honored, but it's just kind of like, oh, look at me, look at me. And, you know, it's, 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 for me, it's a little sad to, to, to see the, in the sexual, mm -hmm. you know, what was the peak of the sexual revolution now very diluted. And I feel like social media has like taken that and just gone with it in a different direction entirely, especially for like women online and even like the hatred that they do get in, in certain cases. And uh, I, oh, yeah, yes. it has changed a lot. And, and Robin, same question uh, for you. How, how has this like changed from when uh, Deep Throat came out in your, in your uh, perspective? Well, my mother became a porn star in 1975, just a couple of years after Deep Throat came out. And at the time she was 35 years old, which was pretty unheard of for a woman in the adult film industry to first mm -hmm. make her, her, her career. Um, and, you know, at the time, at that time, uh, there was just this natural, um, uh, organic kind of na naivete, everyone was, um, there was just a purity, there was a sense of innocence, women were not fake, they were not plastic, they, they had one boob that was larger than the other, they had imperfections, they had birthmarks, they might have a bent, you know, a crooked tooth, not everyone was all glammed up. And, and so there was this, just this kind of connection uh, with, with uh, you know, being erotic as opposed to just what we've developed now as a society, which is just a facade. It's like, we're all, all of us are frosting, but there's no cupcake, okay? So back in the day, there was no frosting. We were all just like letting it hang out and this is who we were. But now there's this artifice where, Every, the filters, I mean, but forget the Botox and the filler and the fake nails and the fake hair and the fake lashes, but then you put a filter on top of that too. There's nothing that's real. So, so you know, the, the golden age of porn uh, really exemplified um, women in particular who had a natural beauty 
that were not afraid of to age and who were comfortable in their skin. And now we've created a culture where, where no woman is comfortable in her skin. It seems we're all, you know, putting on a mask. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And again, like just seeing that shift and like <clears throat> being a part of it in that way and, and no having this background, um, you can see the differences. And I'm, I'm just wondering, like, um, do you think the sexual expression, like in, in like movies um, and media, do you think it would ever like revert, like revert back to that kind of natural state? Or do you think that we're so far past that, that it won't ever go back to that? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I, so I, I, oh, you go. You yeah. go. No, I, I was just going to agree. I think we're so far past it that people they're they're not comfortable with who they are they have to put on their persona and mm -hmm. and once you cross that line you can't you can't go back because yeah. there's so much peer pressure with women and filters and fake everything that they just mm -hmm. can't be yeah. true and real well i want to jump in and answer yeah. that question as well um history has shown us that everything happens in cycles and I was involved in the adult film industry, having worked with my father and then, you know, really um, came into it during the video era. And what I found was that after the, the adult film industry really started with video and these one day wonders, there was a formula that developed because now it was a, a career that you could have as a porn star. So it attracted a lot of women who felt that they needed to be blonde, who felt that they needed to have big breasts that were always fake. And it created this kind of stereotype. And also the, uh, those studios in California were cranking out these films that, you know, it was five sex scenes with uh, a girl girl scene in the middle and so forth. So after a few years of this, the market became so glutted with this homogenous product is that somebody came up with the idea, and I believe it was Ed Powers and Jamie Gillis of doing gonzo porn, where we just drive around and we grab a woman off the street and offer her 500 bucks to just do something or go into people's houses and, and like that. And what it really started was reality porn. And that was so fresh because people were so used to seeing, you know, these these formulaic things of what a couple of people in California thought was erotic over and over and over again, that it became like the new pornography. And so I think, you know, after a while of being inundated with, um, you know, Instagram filters or whatever, people are going to get so sick of just the mm -hmm. artifice of it, that they're going to be really hot and really horny for something that's authentic. doesn't have to fit a stereotype, but that's just real. And let's face it, that's what eroticism is all about. It's not about a look. It's not like fashion and beauty because everybody can get turned on and it's that emotion that's hot. And you can't just paint it with one brush. It doesn't look the same way every time, but everybody has that capacity. Right, no, that's, you that you put that so well. And there's like so many things for, for different people as well. So obviously you need something fresh to kind of get it going. Cause you will get us like a standing point where, you know, it's going to get dull after a while, maybe for some people. So oh, yeah. you know, like, there's going to be a time when the bum on the street is going to be the hottest thing because like, <laughs> wow, look how, look how real that is. Yeah. And I honestly, like the more realistic, the better and the more authentic, the better. And I think mm -hmm. that that's a mm -hmm. way to even go into like the, a new age of porn possibly um, and get something refreshing in that case. And, um, and then yeah. it will change again. Yeah. And, and, and that's a good thing about like this industry is that it's constantly changing and there's new faces and that um, it'll have like different opportunities for different people as well. So that's, it's really great. Um, Robin, did you want to, um, to speak this, to this as well as if it will ever re revert back to a natural state in this industry? Well, it's interesting that you ask that because I am of a certain age. I am 58. And I started realizing a couple of years ago that, oh my God, I'm melting and I've got wrinkles and I need to do all these things that women do to keep themselves young. And then I had an epiphany just a couple of months ago that um, I'm not going to play that game, that I'm going to embrace my beauty that aging is not a disease, which is in American culture, particularly, that's how it is treated. 
And I have this desire, wish, epiphany that it is going to revert. We are going to go to a time and my wish, but I'm kind of feeling it maybe a little bit that we're going to revert to a time or, or, or there'll be a, a renaissance mm -hmm. whereby women with um, wrinkles and, uh, you know, just the, the life that they have lived on their face and on their body becomes something that we honor and yeah. not something that we abhor. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I And especially like in, in American standards, it's really hard to move, move past. Like I'm almost turning 30 and they're like, oh, wow, they age gracefully. I'm like, I'm 30. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I have friends, who, their, I have friends who have daughters in their 20s who are getting fucking Botox. Yeah, it's, it's like, oh, sorry, was I not supposed to say no, that? No, it's okay. Getting Botox. <laughs> um. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's hard. It's hard. It's hard right now. Um, I do want to, I want to speak on something in mainstream media, not only in the adult film industry. Um, I feel like there's been a conversation in regards to sex scenes in movies and how I feel like me personally, they've been lacking chemistry and they've been lacking any form of like an emotional connection during those scenes, or even to have that level of sensuality in mainstream films. Do you think that um, there's been like some kind of censorship with American films in like versus the, um, the adult film industry in that case, Gerard, if you can, if um, you have an answer for that one. <laughs> um, yes. Well, how can I put it? One thing about, about sex and sex scenes, it, people don't realize on a porn set, especially is that it's a lot of work. You know, if it's done well, it seems effortless and beautiful and real. But really, every time you see a different angle, everybody had to stop, the camera has to move, the lights have to change, you, you know, you pat off the sweat and you go back into it. And if it's done right, in the end, it creates this illusion of, of a, you know, of a real connection between the people. Now, you know, Hollywood sex scenes, you know, let's face it, Hollywood has always been governed by this puritanical force. Um, and that's, the importance of Deep Throat when it came out was that people were so, you know, tired of, of this um, puritanical model that they were shown because it didn't reflect their reality. Back in the 1960s, when my father first making film, it was a great, you know, moment in, in history and in, in our culture, um, people's minds were expanding. There were great advances in art and music and culture and thought. I mean, we went to the moon. It was this kind of beautiful period that um, that we seem to have recoiled from, but at least at that moment, you know, in 1968, it was the summer of love, okay, in San Francisco, yet if you turned on the TV, you know, Lucy and Ricky are still sleeping in separate beds, you know, you couldn't even show them in the same bed together by, by law, okay, or by, you know, it really came down to not so much the law as the sponsors, the sponsors mm -hmm. will not support any kind of depictions of, of sexuality. Now, after Deep Throat, Hollywood reacted because they realized that the Hollywood system was failing, that they were losing a lot of money, making these big blockbuster films that nobody was going to see. And yet films like Deep Throat cost very little to make, and now we're making hundreds of millions of dollars. So they thought, well, we better change it up because they wanted to make those dollars too. So there started to be this loosening up in Hollywood. And that's what we refer to when we talk about porno chic mm -hmm. and the golden age of porn in that, that adult films were experiencing this golden age, that they were getting better and better and more elaborate with more production value, because that's what the eroticism is what costs money, okay? Mm -hmm. Sex is cheap. And I've worked on a million one day wonders. And the reason they exist is because you can have people fucking all day long for little money and just roll tape on them and you're done. But in order to create any kind of connection between those people, the mm -hmm. build up, the look, the walk, the story, the, you know, all of that, that's what costs money to make. That's what takes a lot yeah. of time and art and art direction and cinematography to create that illusion. And mm -hmm. so 
um, you know, Hollywood has that, okay, where now the, you know, the video, the world of one day wonder videos did not, it really boiled down to the lowest common denominator. So Hollywood has the capability of doing that, but mm -hmm. America being as puritanical as it is, we have a much bigger appetite for violence. You could see, you know, all kinds of acts just by turning on the TV, my kid mm -hmm. can see horrific things, but God forbid you see, you know, full frontal nudity, you know, and, and people are very uncomfortable. So, you know, that's what's holding Hollywood back. You know, it's possible to create a sense of intimacy, but you need good direction. You need good casting because you need to put people together that can actually, you know, convey that. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not impossible now. It's just, again, is there, you know, there's not the intent for that so much. More intent to show everybody being killed in a brutal mm -hmm. way, you know, there's, you know, that, that's more common, you know, on screen. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Two, point, two points, quick points on that. We were just interviewed by another gentleman in Buenos Aires, and he made a really good point about how infantilized um, films, Hollywood films have become. They're all these Marvel things, and it's all about this fantasy where we're really, you know, they're avoiding anything that looks like, for the most part, reality. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. So there's this hyper violence. There is this hyper fantasy, uh, but we've really lost just the basic one-on-one -on -one human connection. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to see that come back. And, and then to the point that Gerard made, um, my mother has a famous quote where she says, the difference between erotica and pornography is the lighting. <laughs> okay because <laughs> because hollywood can put the, the the vaseline on the on the on the lens and make it look all soft and warm and fuzzy mm -hmm. but you know you get in those tight porno shots what do you what do you call it the plumber shot what do you, yeah do you we call, call it, it the anatomy shot or the plumbing shot <laughs> right where it's like you know up close and personal and mm -hmm. so and so the you, you know there is there's the erotica which is is super important and then there's just this hardcore like you know full on porn and i think that there's there's got to be a way for us as a society to embrace sex i mean you look at like the pam and tommy lee thing where the guy has like a talking fucking dick what is that about you can show a talking dick but you can't mm. show a dick in a vagina what <laughs> you know like i just like right off the bat i'm not i'm not flowing with that yeah i mean i gotta jump in and speak to the mm -hmm. same joke because yeah. you know, robin and i have a lot in common i'll just say that but our parents also had a lot in common her mother and my father, you know, they, they walked a parallel path and he had the very same joke <laughs> that he told to us. So this is how he put it. The difference between pornography and erotica is what I like is erotica. What you like is porn. <laughs> what you like is dirty. What I like is art. And our pal Annie Sprinkle, okay, has the same joke. <laughs> and so I want to share that with you as well because we love Annie. She's been very supportive of us in this whole process. Um, she said, Erot "Eroticism is when you use a feather. In mm -hmm. porn, you use the whole chicken." <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. Oh my God. There's so much knowledge, so much information coming. Uh, um, um, how was uh, one of your first films that you worked on, Gerard, how was the process for you? Like, what did you, what did you learn first, like right off the bat? And if like you've changed over the years? Oh, well, well, it's not that I've changed over the years. The mm -hmm. industry has changed over the years very much. And um, I'm not just speaking about porn. I'm speaking of filmmaking in general. Now, I was fortunate enough to um, have grown up with my father as my father's son. And he was very proud of being a filmmaker. He always included us in what he was doing. So we were always on the set or on location or location scouting. You know, we were never subjected to 
hardcore pornography as children. It wasn't mm. about that. Our right. mother would always usher us off the set when it was time for the nitty gritty. Is what our parents called it. Uh, then the nitty gritty, you know, mom would swoop <laughs> in and, and take us out. But otherwise, we were very comfortable around the cast and the crew. And, you know, we always had film in our, our refrigerator. Mm. So I was able to work alongside my father at a young age. Um, building sets, making props, getting to see the whole thing in action. As soon as I was old enough to be on the set, I was a PA. You know, later I was um, an uh, assistant to my father. But um, I also helped in the editing process where you had to just sync up the dailies of the film. It was a very, you know, laborious task to make film when you shot on film. So I was able to get that training that I totally had to throw away when video happened because then it wasn't as physical anymore. Now it was all on videotape and you had to learn more. And now with a nonlinear editing on computers, it's changed completely again. And it's, it's changed for the better in that, you know, back in the day, if you wanted a simple dissolve to go from this image of us to the, that image of you, you know, like that, you'd have to write it all out on paper and then send it to the lab and then wait for it to come back. And then three days later, you know, you get it and you watch it and you say, that looks like shit. <laughs> and then you got to go through, through it again, where now I go click, 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 ah, click, 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 click. Yeah. I mean, I'd still spend all night doing it, but I've made, you know, 7,000 different versions of it. And I can say, nah, where before, you know, it was a lot a lot more involved and you know it's now more easy to be fluid and creative then you had to really have you know both be left-brained and right-brained at the same time yeah it's, it's a completely different process and to be a part of like you know years worth of like the film industry changing and adapting to it like that's really important as a filmmaker and then you're learning different ways to create something which is really great um, I'm, like, what do you guys think of films like Lovelace or Boogie Nights and how they have like this depiction of the industry? Um, Krista, I can, I can start with you with that question as well. What do you think of like having that and then having, you know, being a part of like this legacy, like in seeing that in, in Hollywood? Well, that's one of the reasons why Gerard and I are creating the documentary, because we see other people's perception of the truth and what happened. And we... Yeah. see that it's wrong it's their yeah. version of it and so that's why it's so important to us to make the real version so people really know the story so yes we feel a little angry that other people mm -hmm. take liberty about you know our lives and our father mm -hmm. and yeah. you know so that's why it's very important for us to show the real story real hap what really happened so we can just set them straight yeah, no, that's very important. And Gerard, same question for you. So I want to I want to jump in and speak sp specifically to Lovelace, the film mm -hmm. Lovelace, because when we heard that this film was in production, we reached out to the production company in good faith to say we're so excited that you're doing this. Um, we're happy to offer any you know any consultation about what really happened, so that you can get the story right, so you can get the story accurate we can give you our father's mm -hmm. perspective on things because we knew that um hank azaria was going to play our, our dad and we're big fans of his we thought what a great choice he would be great um but mm -hmm. our letters came back um returned to sender okay they didn't want to hear from us because they didn't want to hear the true story they already had their story if you saw the film lovelace what they do is they tell the story once with like rose colored glasses and then they wind it back and they tell it again where it's a living hell. And so it's all, you know, white and black, but really her story was 50 shades of gray. I mean, it wasn't either of those. That mm -hmm. film, you know, opens up saying based on true events, which is another way of saying, this is not true events, <laughs> okay? Yeah. You know, there might be yeah. a, a grain of truth in there, but there's a whole beach of bullshit. And so when you watch that movie, neither of those things happened at all. And mm -hmm. so, her story, her real story, is much more interesting. The complexity of this crazy relationship we, which she had with an abusive husband. The, mm -hmm. the story about how her participation in, in adult film really liberated her from him. You know, that didn't, wasn't the cause of her, her abuse, it was the salvation. But that's totally lost in this throwaway movie that really, you know, was, was trying to tell its own story and didn't want to work from the truth. 
Wow. I didn't know that at all. And I'm sorry that that happened because you were like willing to work yeah, but- and like offer it too, you know, like that's, mm-hmm. that's, mm-hmm. that's not right at all. No, but- the, the truth is, and you know, we spoke to our lawyer early on about this kind of thing is that our father was a public figure. Mm-hmm. So he's out there. So, you know, you can't control what people are going to say about him, but that's why we feel it's important to get the truth out there too, at least so we could yeah. stand next to everything else. Yeah, of course. No, that 100%. The truth is always the best way to go. And that's why like creating this documentary is really important. Um, Robin, same question for you in regards to seeing Hollywood kind of like glamorize certain instances of, you know, the porn industry in that case. Like, how did you feel seeing like Boogie Nights in, in Lovelace in that case? Well, I must confess I've not seen Lovelace, but um, when Boogie Nights first came out, um, I found it entertaining. I really did. Um, You know, uh, because I've grown up in the industry, I was 12 years old when my mother made her first adult film. And so um, I found it to be fun and entertaining. Um, My mother did not have the same experience, but of course, she came from a different, you know, a whole different part of the of of the history she felt of course that it was told inaccurately um but i would also say that overall uh i thought it was interesting you know the same thing with um the deuce on hbo where they've taken you know our entire childhood and everyone that we knew and then they (laughs) fictionalized these characters and now all people are making a profit on on these on, on this on this era um so, I mean, I think in a way it's good because it helps people, uh, it, it, it draws attention to the industry, but not always in a good light. And that's always kind of hard to do. That's a fine line. I will say that I'm working on a, a biopic of my mother's life and a documentary as well. And my greatest fear is that somebody is going to, you know, make a schlock doc or... <laughs> You know, uh, <laughs> my mother was an amazing human being and she, you know, I, she, she needs to be shown in that light. And it would just really be heartbreaking for me if someone turned her into this, you know, evil, manipulative, yeah. conniving woman, because she wasn't. So I'm working with a top Hollywood person right now who really believes in my mother's story. And so I'm excited to tell that. And it's been a process on not, not unlike Gerard getting his documentary made. Oh, that, no, that's great. You guys have all these wonderful projects and, and, uh, you know, I'm really happy for all of you. And, uh, this is so great. 50 years later, celebrating deep throat and, uh, just thank you guys so much for your time and congratulations on all your projects and, uh, good luck in the future with everything else.